Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this series. Get smarter by solving problems at brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. Lots of people follow this YouTube channel because of the vlogs I made during my PhD in atmospheric physics at the University of Exeter. Unfortunately, however, I had to graduate at some point, and that necessarily meant the end of my videos showing what doing a PhD was like. However, there are lots of people out there doing interesting PhD projects, and so in this video series, I'm spending a few days with a new researcher each episode, showing you what their life is like, learning a bit about them, and learning about the topic of their thesis. This episode, I'm spending some time with Zoe Glatt, a researcher at LSE in London, writing her PhD thesis on YouTube. Somehow, she has turned watching YouTube videos and writing about it into a PhD project. So to find out how studying my job is her research, I met her with her at her home. What about this project interested you then? I've been very into YouTube since 2007, 2006, 7. I was fully part of that. You know, when I was a teenager, I like found these people who did videos and it was like the Vlog Brothers and Five Awesome Girls and stuff like that. And yeah. those were the people like Mika Kitty or Tessa Violet now. I was very into watching them when I was a teenager and then I did vlogging for a bit in like 2008 and then I got embarrassed and I stopped. But ever since then, I've been like, very passionate about what what it is and the fact that you have like community building and that you can communicate with people in any part of the world and that that was really exciting to me and then since then i've seen a commercialism of the space occur and i think that that kind of bothered me and obviously since then it's become like a huge industry and i and i think it's fine now because i realize i see it i've reframed it as a career so it's like of course people are making money that's there's no problem with people making money yeah but i think there's something about that transition really fascinated me because because make no mistake, making YouTube videos is a serious career for tens of thousands of people now. In some youth demographics, it's the most desirable career, making entertainment for some 2 billion monthly users on YouTube. Just like most careers, some very few lucky people are able to make a lot of money from their YouTube channels, while most just about manage to make ends meet. I've been a full-time content creator for two years now, so I have a natural interest in Zoe's research on this subject. But I was curious about how she ended up studying this. How, how does one become a YouTuber researcher? <laughs> well, my undergrad was anthropology. Right. I studied that at SOAS in London, and um, they didn't have any expertise in like internet cultural media anthropology, um, but I just knew that I wanted to talk about online culture and YouTube, um, so I just did it. Hmm. Uh, and my and that undergraduate dissertation was like a very utopic kind of um, study of the nerd fighter community in London. In 2013 I wrote that and then I went away and worked in television for a couple of years and then I <laughs> did my masters at Goldsmiths in digital media which was in the media department and mm. finally there were people who actually were interested in talking about media which is like I love anthropology but anthropology is quite slow to catch up with sort of digital right. techniques. So to be able to do a PhD about it and get paid to basically watch, watch YouTube, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and like meet my favorite YouTubers, like that's really cool. Zoe's research takes the form of an ethnography, which means understanding the lived experiences of her subjects, YouTubers, by immersing herself in those experiences, walking a thousand miles in their shoes kind of thing. This involves spending time with them in person, conducting interviews, and being part of their ecosystem online. So there's an auto-ethnographic component, making her own videos, which somewhat gratifyingly, she said she found both difficult and frustrating. Told you it was hard. However, another key component is attending events out in the real world about online video, about its community and about its industry. And as luck would have it, a big one was right on her doorstep this year. One of the big events in the online video calendar is VidCon. VidCon London is this weekend. Zoe is here talking to YouTubers and getting more data collection in for her thesis. So I'm here talking to her. If you've never been to a VidCon, it's a celebration of online video in all its safe for work forms. Practically, this means it's domination by YouTube and more recently TikTok. Before talking in more detail about Zoe's thesis, I wanted to show you a little bit of how she approaches the industry via this event and how she conducts some field work. Thanks to my friend Hannah Witten, I was able to get an access all areas pass for the VidCon, which Zoe also had, allowing us to go to all the panels and events and behind the scenes. We met up at a packed panel that Hannah was speaking on about creator burnout. 
when you're watching something like that, mm. how are you dissecting it? Because I'm watching it as a creator and kind of empathising. Uh, I am empathising because my PhD is about the experiences of creators and, and mm. because I'm an anthropologist I'm trying to like get into the minds of the creators as much as possible but at the same time I'm trying to think about how it fits into existing literature. Right, so you're labor. thinking oh, that, that, that correlates with something right. that I read in this study. Like kind of for example that something that always sticks out in general when you're studying creative industries, labour in the creative industries is this kind of idea that you do what you love for a living yeah. which has been critiqued a lot in the literature and it's not a critique of the people who do that labour at all because everyone wants to do what they love for a living but it's a critique of what that means and this perfectly highlights that because it's like the idea that you would work all hours of the day is very typical in the creative industries yep. and the justification is often well I'm doing what I love and it's like well no no one should be working all the time and that's yeah. actually a really toxic um, structure Basically, I'm doing an ethnographic study of YouTubers. Well, it started as YouTubers and now I say content creators because that is the term that people use and people work across platforms. I'm trying to understand their lived experiences and their labor within the online video industry. Um, there's a lot of research on creative industries, uh, like previous, more traditional, like TV and stuff, but not much on like social media industries. So it's also kind of a social media industry study. One of the few journalists in the world who covers YouTube meaningfully and is also interested in studying social media is Chris Stokel Walker, who also wrote one of the books on Zoe's shelf. He also chaired the panel my friend Hannah was on, and afterwards we took to the convention floor together to see how researchers and journalists view YouTube events a little bit differently. When you're looking around the convention hall, yeah. what do you think you see that the average person who comes to Bitcoin doesn't see? Like, what, what does this all say to you? Crass commercialism. No. Um, no, you see the story behind it. So you see, like, the bright lights and the shiny bits, but then you go, actually, why is this here? What is the purpose of it? Like, what's the... Is this a, a reasonable representation, though, of what the YouTube landscape is like? Yeah, because it changed. Because, because it's just commercial. Yeah, because it, it, to what Tom Byrne says, which is that like it changed in 2012, 2013, when suddenly creators got too big, and so you couldn't have everybody in a room. Like, I have yeah. done panel preparation where you get whisked from like one backstage bit to another. Yeah, and they're not, and you're told not to walk around the floor, yeah. you're not supposed to if you're a feature creator. Yeah. So even though the creators want to interact, I think, yeah. a lot of the time with their audiences, they're not really allowed to outside of very, very small, organised spaces. And it's much worse in LA. Yeah. Like, it's a next level thing. But even here, like, you see, you know, the badges, right? Like, we have these yellow ones, which means we can go places, but there's the, red, is it red? Red is community, or red is community. purple is creator, and they're just completely separate spaces. Wait a minute, we found something that us old people are actually interested in. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's so strange to see something that was in my childhood bedroom in like a relic case. It's a GameCube, we, we were just saying that there's big TikTok uh, activation or something but over there. Um, oh good, my, I immediately also thought of Robot Wars. I think it's interesting comparing this year to last year. Last year it felt quite dead. Um, I described it as like a colonial exhibition for a dying empire last year. And what's different I think this year is that TikTok has added so much capital, so much energy and a younger audience to it. Yeah. But, I mean, would you think, take, Chris is definitely an expert on TikTok. Do no, you I'm think, really old. TikTok's revitalizing the whole online video industry in that they are plowing money into this thing. So they are paying for sponsored events and discussions in the whole thing. They are paying for the meet and greet hall. And also when you go out into the actual kind of like everyday environment in the XL, they are the, like the TikTokers are the ones that are actually kind of roaming about because they're not actually officially acknowledged. They're, and they're also not so big yeah. that they're going to get swamped. But looking a little bit behind the lens here, we've been watching this group here prepare to do a TikTok for what's felt like the past five minutes. Um, their camera guy's possibly just stolen the camera and that he just picked it up and run in that direction. We are wondering if they're going to get moved on by security before they can actually finish filming. <laughs> Exciting developments, their camera guy is returning. <laughs> very 
very slowly. He's the guy in orange. So out of the way, I'm trying to film somebody filming a TikTok here. I could record a TikTok faster than this. I could download the app, learn how to do a, t a dance, and do it faster than this. Oh my god, did they mess it up? <laughs> yeah, I assumed that there was like a dance troupe branding. I'm trying so hard not to laugh. That was it. All of these people were watching. <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> no, I'm really old. What we've seen so far is what Zoe is studying and how she collects her data. But how do you convert observations from a VidCon and from watching YouTube videos into a thesis? She invited me to her department at LSE to take a look at her system, how she converts the raw data into something more meaningful, and to discuss her findings. So this is the software that you've been using to kind of categorize and make sense of all of your field notes. So, so right. what, what data have you put into this? Well, <laughs> so this is in vivo. There are lots of other programs you can use, but this is just the one that I use. But basically, I categorize it by type of data collection. Um, so autoethnography, um, those are my autoethnographic field notes about making videos, general field notes. I have interviews. Um, I've got a few other names on here that you may or may not recognize. <laughs> VidCon UK USA, those, that's where I keep my field notes for that. And then I have my online ethnography, which I split down into different types as well. So, so can you show like an example of the actual raw data? So you have my interview transcript. Yeah. The reason I know Zoe is because nearly two years ago, she interviewed me as one of her earliest bits of data collection for the thesis. And the transcript to the interview reveals that I was somewhat um, fresh out of the PhD myself when she talked to me. We were chatting for so long before we started recording. <laughs> this, <line here. laughs> this one, my name is Dr. Simon hey, Clark. Clark. I finally, finally did, did it. it. But how do you convert like this transcript? How do you convert the raw data? Yeah into something that you can write about? Because I'm guessing you're right. not just scrolling through. So obviously the interviews all look like this. This is very. This was a three and a half hour interview, I think. Yeah, we yeah, talked I didn't stop for talking. so long. Some of them were like an hour long. Those are just the interviews though, which is like one third probably of my data collection. Wow. Um, and then, so for example, when I'm doing online ethnography, where I'm going across platforms, I'm basically collecting screenshots of anything I think is interesting. Okay. Um, the one that I think is probably most useful is YouTube videos and comments. Okay, so here you go. This is how much YouTube paid for me for my million viewed video. And when I import it, I'll basically highlight the title and then I'll code it. This is where- So, so you're using code in a different sense to what I would use. You're what, using, how do you use so it? So I would use it in terms of like programming. Right, no, no, no. Like Python or something. Yeah, You're yeah. using, is it almost like a form of metadata? It's like, the type of analysis is called thematic analysis. So you could do thematic analysis on anything. I'll do it on my field notes, on my videos that I collect, on my interview transcripts, on everything. Uh, and basically I'm just assigning some words, whatever, it could be one word, it could be a sentence, whatever, to that data that I've imported. Okay, so it could be talking about, that That might have the coding of like money, for example. Exactly. Right. So, like, let's see, if I start to type it in, you'll see all of my codes that are existing that I already have that say okay, money. Right, yeah. So creators work on other channels for money, conspicuous consumption versus coyness about money, but I would code this. I'd also code it to the person. Oh, and the okay. date. Right. So I have multiple different kind of intersections of codes. So you're basically crunching down all the raw data into like a refined form. Yeah. With ethnographic research, it's inductive and it's called grounded theory. And the point is that you basically collect. At the beginning, you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Right. You're, you know what the culture is that you're looking for. Um, like I knew I was going to be studying YouTube. When I started, I didn't even know I was going to be studying the labor of content creators. Right. So it was so broad, it was like, I want to know everything about this industry, I want to talk to audiences, I want to talk to creators, I want to talk to industry people. And then once I started actually getting into it, the thing that I was drawn to and found most interesting was the labour of content creators. So you write notes, and the notes I wrote at the beginning of my project, this was the first bit of offline field work I did, they're so broad, like the things I'm talking about aren't really about the things that I'm talking about now, because the 
the, basically a project follows what they call, what Hammersley and Atkinson call a funnel structure, where mm-hmm. you start really broad and it gets narrower and narrower as you get towards the end of the project. The coding does the same thing. It's an iterative process. So you're coding throughout and then you have your nodes, which I'll show you. Um, and you refine the nodes, the thematic analysis over time to, to, to be grouped into like meta nodes or codes. Mm-hmm. And then those become the big themes for the project. Welcome to day two of VidCon. I'm up here in the Create Track. We're going to be going to have a look into some of the sessions, but also there is a meetup of study tubers, which I feel like I can, well, but I can kind of go to, right? Hang on, oh god, getting everybody in at height is going to be interesting. Yeah. I just stand on the chair, yeah. <laughs> it's, look, it's Pixel Girl's subscription box. Um, I'm here with Ali. <laughs> Honestly, you two, I swear, are all she watches. Yes. Called out right now. Yeah, yeah she doesn't even watch me, to be fair. Um, I'm here with Ruby Granger. Hello. And with Ali Abdal. Yo. And we were just doing, well, what, how, it was a meetup for edu people. No, it was yeah, study tubers. Study tubers. Yes. Yes. So, what do you get out of VidCon? What is the purpose of coming to VidCon? I love meeting people. I know that's kind of, that's like the really standard thing to say yeah. but um, not um, like you get to meet so many viewers that you only ever usually meet on, like, so it's online. like a, it's a meetup but also networking like you're meeting other creators yeah exactly exactly kind of the same for me like I don't think the talks themselves were hugely you know interesting or whatever but like talking to the people during the talks and after the talks was like really good because my theory of VidCon is it's like a renaissance trade fair and you get like all, all the weavers from all across the kingdom come in one place because oh, yeah. you don't otherwise meet <laughs> and then you get yeah, the weavers yeah. so and, you... and then suddenly everyone's there and it's really strange to meet people because mm. you've only ever seen them on a screen and then like to see them 3D I always yeah, find really strange like, well, it's, it is a little bit disorienting you know in a funny old way being here and everybody filming and the fact that you know there's like content creation happening right behind me there's just people filming and making stuff this feels incredibly at home for me this is the way that I, this is my job, you know, um, and yet at the same time it's so apparent that my job is only a small part of online video, you know, EduTube, um, doing stuff about science is such a tiny slither of the pie and here you see the whole thing and you see just how bizarre a lot of this is and I think I see, in a way, I kind of see my job from an outside perspective when I come to events like this because you realise how ridiculous this, this whole filming thing looks. It's weird, I feel both at home and also alienated from myself. Basically, the the general structure of a thesis in my discipline is intro, lit review and theoretical framework, methodology, and then you have like empirical chapter one, two, three, usually, sometimes four. Theory, theoretical framework and methodology and data are both chapters. One, two, and three here are, are oh. actual empirical chapters. Yeah. And you'll see here, I mean, it doesn't say it, you can see what they're called, but um, these are just provisional. They're not the real titles, but they're just to remind me what I'm talking about. Yep. But basically the way this is this was two and a bit years into the project that me and in conjunction with my supervisor finally figured out like how to structure the narrative. And basically what it is, is that ch- the first empirical chapter is going to be like the broad macro level, the industry, the talent agents, the events like VidCon and stuff like this. Like what is the community industry like. The second one's going to be about um, the relationship between creators and audiences, so the kind of meso level, what I, I would call, um, which is will be the one probably where I talk most about the actual content that people make and the ways in which they interact with their audiences. And it will be to do with like authenticity and intimacy and money. And then the final chapter is the micro level of basically the subjectivity of the creator themselves. And I have this kind of quagmire of ideas going around at the moment because I haven't really pinned it down. But I know that what I'm trying to say in that chapter is something to do with what happens when someone works in an industry that's a creative industry, but it's also a heavily quantified and metrified metric. It's a metric and algorithm driven creative Creative industry. industry. And what happens to the self when the brand, your self brand is you and your life and your interests, um, depending on the type of channel, especially with like vloggers or lifestyle creators, you know, literally their life is the product. Uh, so that last chapter is all about like the subject, basically the, the subject that, that gets produced in this industry. And then conclusions will be something in the area of like 
Do you know what they are yet? Or is there something well, that you need to write the chapters first? I ha yeah, I mean, they, I'm sure they'll be different to what I think they're going to be now, but I know that I'm trying to figure out what's interesting or unique about this particular industry that brings together, like, is an extension of previous creative industries, but also is a platform-based in industry, is an internet culture-based industry, and is heavily designed around metrics and algorithms. I'm trying to say something about like what does it mean to work in the intersection of those two yeah, things. It's not, it's not the kind of thing where you can have a definite conclusion at the end. It's not a one sentence summary yeah. that you can do. It's a big... No. <laughs> this is, this is no. a lot of stuff right. around this subject. It's not yeah. something that you can draw a conclusion Yeah, about. And basically what you call it with with anthropology, this is going to be a monograph. So it's a book, It's a hundred. it will be about 100,000 words that tries, by the end, I would hope that someone reading it would feel like they had a really good understanding of what it means to work in this industry, what the, the kind of cultural factors that take, take part yeah. in working in this industry. Something that I was curious about in making this video was how Zoe and I approach YouTube differently. We are both trained academics and both use or used YouTube for an academic purpose. She studies it while I used it to disseminate my research. Yet while our backgrounds are very different and our interactions with the website coming from very different angles, there are undeniable similarities. Spending several days with Zoe, both filming and discussing academia, it became clear that there are definite parallels between academia and being a YouTuber. And this is something that's already been researched. There's this concept called the neoliberal worker subject, which is a concept that I use a lot in relation to uh, YouTubers or content creators, um, but it also completely applies to academics, which is like basically when like your work becomes your life and you're passionate about your work, but you're also working all sorts of hours and yeah. your friends are also your colleagues and it's just like your life becomes about your work. Yeah. And that is unfortunately what has happened. That's, that's both, <laughs> both of the careers I've had have yeah. been exactly that. Yeah. So it would seem that while I changed professions from academia to YouTube, Perhaps my work didn't change much at all. Zoe's research is still ongoing and she's still drawing her conclusions, but after everything she's learned so far and everything she's seen, and particularly this similarity between YouTubing and being an academic, I had to ask, would she not want to be a YouTuber herself now instead of just researching it? Does this make you want to be a YouTuber more or less, having taken such a deep dive on the experience? <laughs> less, yeah, definitely less. I've enjoyed making content and I really like having a channel where I feel like some people, mostly other researchers, can hear about what I'm studying because I think some people think that's quite cool that I'm mm. sharing findings in a video format because it's, it's actually very unusual for a researcher. There's no way that I'd want to do it to earn a living. It's so hard. Honestly, I, don't, I really don't think I could do it. <laughs> it is. It's it, so it, hard. It's ball breaking. <laughs> it's the money thing. It's like once you need to make money, you have to then really worry about your, your figures, your viewing figures. Like so many things come into play when you have to actually earn a living from it. But I'm very happy to make videos and put them on the internet for people to see, you know? Which is it, YouTubing in its purest form. In a sense, yeah. <laughs> This video series is supported by Brilliant, and if you've just watched an entire video about a PhD project, then I'll bet that you're both interested in education and in pushing yourself. Brilliant has been an ideal sponsor for this series because that's exactly what their website and app are all about. Learning through solving problems, pushing yourself and your understanding of a subject forwards by tackling questions. Brilliant are continually adding new content, and just this month they launched a new course on cryptocurrency, all about the maths and technology behind cryptocurrencies. But but if you'd prefer to push your understanding of algebra, gravitational physics, calculus, chemistry, or probability, then they have courses on all these and more. Personally, I've been learning from the course on chemistry as a way to stay sane in lockdown, and just spending a few minutes a day tackling problems and working my brain muscles has done wonders for my mental health. If you'd like to buy Brilliant as a gift for a student you know, or be selfish and keep it to yourself, then head to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, and the first 200 viewers to do so will get 20% off their annual subscription. Thanks to Brilliant for their continued support of this series. Thanks to Zoe for agreeing to be part of this series, though in a slight role reversal, I think she actually got more data out of it than I did. And of course, thank you for watching it. If you enjoyed it, then check out the other episodes in the series on the screen right now. And if you'd like to see more, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.